house nerdvana. My daughter's always teasing me about my proclivities, um, though she's one to talk. Anyway, um, I just was really attracted to this article because at first, that was the metaphor I had often used for my writing, but it took me years and years of honing my craft to transpose the music I heard in my head on the page. You know how you have this great idea for an essay or a story, and the writing of it falls short? Maybe it doesn't for you, but <laughs> you sort of get it on paper and you think, they'll be heartbroken, or they'll be so moved, or they'll just be amazed at what I discovered. And people are like, yeah, I don't really get it. And it took a long time to be able to bring those threads together so that that experience was the same for someone else and I could get that down. So first I just liked that article for that reason. But in that article, the surgeon actually left his wife and being a surgeon to um, compose and uh, you know, play piano in orchestral arrangements. Um, so I had finished one novel and it was time to start another one. I went to an artist colony, which I get to do now and then just to write. And I sat down and I thought, okay, you know, what are we going to do here? I know. A, pediatrics, uh, a pediatric psychologist, psychotherapist is struck by lightning and all he wants to do is barbecue. Okay. So the line just, that line just came to me. Pediatric psychotherapist, struck by lightning, all he wants to do is barbecue. That's kind of a joke, right? That's sort of, that's almost like a punch line. So I started typing that thinking like this will be a short story. A short story is not a joke, but a short story is kind of like one arrow shot at a target. And a novel is more like a whole quiver of arrows shot near, they sort of cluster such that you can recognize what the target was, but it's not as direct. And so I started writing that, and um, then I, I had written his scene of getting struck by lightning, and then I thought, well, let's do a little research on what happens to people if they're not killed. And when I did the research, which is something we can talk about, about how much real life and fiction and how much you get to make up. And, I was happy with the scene I had written about imagining him being struck, which was sort of just supposed to be transcendent and kind of trippy. But when I looked up what happens to people who aren't killed by lightning, it turns out they have all the symptoms that a pediatric psychotherapist would be treating. So they have attention deficit issues, impulsivity stuff, post-traumatic stress. I was like, okay, well now this is personal. And now that kind of deepening of that extra layer, I thought, okay, I'm not writing a short story, I'm writing a novel. And then I went into Will's point of view, and then I really thought, okay, I, this really is going to be a novel. Um, you know, and then many years elapsed, but we can talk about that. Um, I thought I'd just read to you a tiny little passage. Um, uh, I'm going to sit down. I'm warning you. That uh, takes place, and, then, I, and I'll, then I'll tell you why I picked it. So it's kind of a sexy passage, and it's, um, if you're following along in your hymnals, it's on page 77. Tony has taken Brooke, their daughter, to um, gymnastics practice. So Owen's out of the hospital, and um, she's left him home alone. And, you know, make sure he knows how to hit the emergency button on the phone. And then as she's out in the world, she realizes, oh my god, he could get himself into so much trouble. So she races home. Um, okay. So this is, starts on page 77. While she is deep in magical thinking, Tony imagines that Owen might be enjoying his time alone. He complained about the lack of privacy in the hospital. Maybe he's reading a medical journal. Maybe he's watching more of the Olympics. Maybe his heart has stopped. Tony speeds toward the intersection despite the light, and when she sees the white flash of the camera in her rearview mirror, she welcomes documentation that she hurried home. In a day or two, an envelope will arrive bearing the evidence, a photograph of her rear end, license plate in perfect focus, racing through the red light at Wilson Road to get to her husband. In fact, when she runs into the house, sweaty and anxious all over again, he is on his donut in his boxers, exactly as she left him, consulting the laptop at the kitchen table. She approaches him from his deaf side, Sunburned and bearded, he's grinning at the screen, and he looks remarkably game. He's sitting with his gut tucked beneath their kitchen table, briefly in no need of assistance, and he exudes the wry confidence of a movie star. He has always been supremely assured, and when she sees him like this, desire juices through her, stunning in its unfamiliarity and its insistence. No wonder she bursts into tears at a moment's notice. She's just been fantasizing him dead, even as she tormented herself about leaving him alone and in danger. 
She is going to have to readjust to traveling through time, not to mention space. She is practically felled by her vertiginous thoughts of lust and a life apart. She remembers how they clung to each other when she miscarried, when his mother was found dead, when they spent a weekend alone at their beach shack, fucking in every room, what Owen called breaking it in. Tony kisses him on the top of his fluffy head, and she sees that the creepy red trails have finally faded from his arm. Just the woman I've been thinking about, he says, leering. His erection is peeking out of his boxers. Tony says, Jesus, are you looking at porn? Pits. I'm going to make one for us. Something in stone where we can cook all the live long day. When the wood gets hot enough, the pit ends up doing the cooking. Then we'll have us a pig pull and you will be happy. I will? Tell me how happy I will be. Though rarely alone in the hospital, they'd kissed. And she has to admit he'd become a better kisser in the storm. Once he cupped her ass when a specialist inquired if he could feel anything. Tony pulls a chair close to him and he nuzzles her. His beard at the hollow of her neck makes her tingle and heat up. Sauce dribbling down that lovely chin as you crunch through the burnt sugar crusted on the skin, he says. I'll eat the skin. You will. And you will love it. He leans forward for another kiss, one of deep appreciation. Oh, how he appreciates her, softly tasting her lips and in no apparent rush toward the next step, savoring her, drinking her in with great interest and presence all the way through the end of the kiss, after which she leans away to catch her breath. Owen wears a smile of mischievous delight, like a new lover, but better, really, because here is the familiarity of Owen without habit, as if the past were prologue. She feels recognized, known, but also separate and fresh and she eagerly wants him alive and in, in their bed with her. Owen reaches out his good hand, which in itself is unfamiliar because she's accustomed to holding his other one, to being on his right side. Each time he lifts his right foot, he lightly squeezes her palm, either because of the pain or the effort a single step engenders. He lets go of her so he can clutch the banister to ascend the stairs. In their bedroom, she undresses herself, her linen shift floating easily up and over her head, while Owen wrestles his boxers to the ground. He undresses the bed, chivalrously gesturing for her to climb aboard. And then he strokes regions of her, encanting words he's never uttered over her body. Baby's back ribs, he says, petting the backside of her ribs slightly hidden beneath a layer of fat. He caresses the great slope of her hip and says, saddle. He is playful and chatty as he stretches across her. Here is the tender and lean Tony loin. Then he returns to her side and kisses the top half of her breast. Behold, brisket of wife. He quits speaking of her as a piece of meat and fondles her fondly. His good hand is very good. Whew, there's your Valentine's Day reading. <laughs> the reason I chose that part, not just because it's a little bit racy for me, but also because um, we were talking just before uh, we came in here, uh, what are you aiming at in your novel? You know, is it a literary novel? Is it a commercial novel? Is it a romance? Is it a mystery? Is it a thriller? Is it? And um, and my husband says to me, you hate it when people call you a comic novelist, but you love it when people say they laughed out loud. And I was really conscious. You're not really supposed to feel this, but when I was writing that scene, that every line evokes his accident and his sort of transcendent feeling about it. He doesn't really want to come back to normal. I mean, the whole book is about what is normal. And so each line is sort of sexy and appealing to her. I mean, he's, when you've been married for a long time, it's kind of exciting that things are a little bit newer. But they're also heartbreaking. He's talking about her as a piece of meat. It's all, that's all he sees anything as, is cooking, 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 barbecue. And, um, and so every line has to sort of hit all of those notes and show them as a long married couple, but also show them him as a convalescing guy who kind of is a very drawn to the injuries that he's had. You know, will he be so changed by his accident that he will leave them? What's the worst thing that someone you love could do? Yeah, just turn their back on you. And so I talk to a lot of high school students who've read this book because I'm on the board of Penn Faulkner and I go to these writers and school visits. And, and, um, and it's really interesting because at first I'll say, you know, what if he just leaves the family? And, and invariably, they're like juniors and seniors in high school, invariably they'll say, well, why not? I mean, it's his life and the kids are on their own. They're in these private schools and they're doing fine. They're in college. And 
you know, what does he owe them? Okay, that's true. And then I'll say, like, let's talk about someone you dearly love saying, I want to be over here. It's nothing personal. I just don't really want to think about you anymore. I want to think about this and how devastating that is. And so that's sort of the question I'm playing with in this book. How much can you change in a family unless you don't want to be in that family anymore? And, um, and then the other thing I'm playing with again and again and again is what's normal? Those SAT words that you were asked to memorize that nobody uses. Like, what is up with that? Why are you tested on words that nobody uses? And um, uh, him medicating children to be normal, like that's confusing, except lots of those kids benefit from it. In fact, he is the guy who's really good at that. What if there were other ways of being? What if the world were more tolerant? Um, and he feels that way about himself. So anyway, let's talk about anything you want. I just wanted to start out with what prompted the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I wonder Yeah, that's a great question because you, 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 as a novelist, you kind of carry these things for a while. You know, you carry the phrases of your life for a while, and then when you figure out how to turn them and look through them, look at them through several prisms, then you've got something going. So that's an actual line from Adam Phillips, who's a very famous British um, sociologist. He writes, he's incredibly prolific. And um, it was in an article in the New York Times in a profile of him, working with families who have autistic children, he said to, the, to his you know, line was, the art to family life is to not take it personally. And I have kids, and they're challenging. And um, I, t I talk to a lot of people who have uh, children who are challenging. And I read that line and just like barked. I mean, I was <laughs> reading it on a Sunday afternoon. And it was absurd because, yeah, that would be great if you could not take family life personally. But only the doctor can say that. You're in the family. How are you going to not take it personally? So I carried that paradox around for a while that this is the perfect piece of advice that you couldn't ever take. Let me give you a piece of advice that's brilliant that you cannot implement in your life. That's sort of like a little mind game, right? And then I thought when I was playing with Owen, oh, let's make it personal. So that's his kind of mantra and that's why he's so good at what he does because in fact, I don't know how much experience you guys have with autism or the spectrum disorders or have any of you worked with kids or have siblings or been through some of this. In fact, it's not personal. So, you know, you as a parent, you want your child to be able to sit at Thanksgiving dinner and participate. And there are all sorts of kids who cannot do that. It has nothing to do with you or the dinner you made or who's at dinner. They cannot sit at that table and this smells weird, and they don't like the way the steam is on the back. And it's not about you. But as a parent, it's very hard to sort of walk that line. So um, I just was fascinated by that. And when I turned it on it being uh, something that now he was applied to him, I knew I had something. Yeah, it's kind of like turning it on its head. Yeah, and in fact, you know, to go back to that being a, a, a piece of advice, to hear that from someone and to separate, you are not your children. And um, to, to separate your children from yourself is healthy. But family life is 
there is something personal about family life. <laughs> it wouldn't be a family otherwise. And, and so that metaphor, the other metaphor that, was, that I was holding on to was that web. Is it a safety net or are we trapped? You know, how much do you rely on the other people in your family to say, stay with me? You know, I miss you. Are you coming home for Thanksgiving? Or thinking, oh my God, I'm trapped. These people are not helping me. They're suffocating me. You know, is it a straight jacket or is it a, is it a leg up? It's both. It's both all the time, right? I mean, sometimes they're helpful and sometimes you, cut, you want to be cut out of that. Um, so I just took it to the extreme, because that's the other thing you get to do in fiction. Like, let's ride that wave as far as I possibly can. Yeah. Come on, ask me more. Bring it on. All right, Kelly. kind of on a different note, but mm -hmm. I'll say it's a different family. Um, I thought it was interesting how you wrote about twins. And, yeah. Because I have a twin myself, so like, I was very like interested in that part, and a lot of it was actually pretty relatable. I mean, on a lesser scale. How many of you? Uh, are, are a twin. Oh my gosh. One, two, three, four. That's pretty amazing. How many of you have a twin in your uh, brothers and sisters? So now that's sort of at least five families in this classroom with twins. Okay, go ahead. So yeah, I was just wondering like... That would not have been the case 20 years ago. So that's really, that's like true research? Like that's like oh God, yeah. That's Older parents, uh, fertility issues. Oh yeah, burgeoning. Um, so when I was growing up, it was just like this novelty. People still get excited, though. They're like, I have a twin. What? Secret language? Do you have a secret language? I mean, people do that whole thing, right? Um, so what's interesting about that is you won't believe, or maybe you will, how many twins are in novels. Now that I've written a novel with identical twins, oh my god, it's embarrassing how many novels there are in twins. So you get to play with that notion of same and other, same and other, right? And, and the mirror image and, and the same thing, change. How much can you change and still stay in the family? And, and so, you know, Ricky and Will are two completely different people sharing exactly the same, you know, DNA. So they're identical twins. And um, there's a novella by Jane Smiley called Ordinary Love that I adore. It's beautifully structured. It's an early work of hers and um, identical twins. So I wrote this novel and then I was teaching that book and I thought, oh no, I hope there's nothing in this book that is <laughs> in my book because that's a fear as a novelist that you've kind of appropriated something that you've read because you're always reading as well as writing and there wasn't, but it, there's the same dilemma in that novella. One of the brothers goes to India for two years and she asks the question, are we getting back the same person that we sent away and he wants to separate from his brother and his brother doesn't want to separate from him. And, so in this book, I was playing with that sort of Jacob and Esau story. How many of you know the Bible? Yeah, this is another interesting dilemma because I haven't taught my kids the Bible. That was kind of maybe a mistake. But as, a, as an artist, it's really handy to know. Um, so I was playing off the, the Jacob and Esau story is that they're, they're brothers and, and uh, Jacob is the older and he sells his birthright for basically a cup of soup to his brother. And, and so, uh, you know, Will is the older twin. He doesn't want to be the older twin. He's sick of setting an example. He's sick of sort of reining himself in for his brother's um, benefit and also being his father's favorite. I mean, they're sort of designated. He's dad's and, and, and Rick is mom's. And, and you learn why Ricky has been on his mother's mind um, because of his issues in the womb. And you learn why uh, Will and his father are more twinned in that way, too. Um, but. He so does not want to be in that spot. And then when he, in fact, gives up his birthright, he's unmoored. He, does, he completely spins out. It's as if he's just become untethered and gone off, and now he's really lost, dreadfully lost. Did that? I forgot what your question was. I don't twins. Think I really had a question. I twins. It was twins. Um, it's yeah. fascinating. I mean, you're, you're, the, think of now when you read novels, maybe you already have. I mean, you could make a huge stack of books yeah. with twins. But the, the play with twins is that then I can start pairing off everybody. And, and, and the twins are asking, are we, oh my god, are we always pairing ourselves off? Because we're so accustomed to going through life with, accompanied by someone. And so, you know, when, when uh, Will and Kyra get together, when Ricky um, a arrives at school, are, they're sort of asking themselves, is this conscious or is this just, am I only a half a person if I don't? meet up with somebody. 
um, and then which parent goes with which kid. So it's just a nice way to kind of do those cups around, who's under what cup. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was really good. So. Thank you. Um, so I wish I could see your name. Irene, hi. So um, on my notes, then, um, we were talking about how um, in the book, not only the, in, okay, so like in the book, we see so many other things that are boring and tiring character. A boring and what? In some ways, you're asking a point of view question, it right, sounds to me. Yeah, like, I just want to know, like, as an author, like, how are all these details, like, um, intentional, or is this just... Everything is intentional. There's the answer to that question. And I didn't bring all my diagrams, my obsessive-compulsive diagrams, but um, boy, do I have them. Uh, so Tony, <coughs> one of the things about Tony is that I love her. I love them all. This is the point of view of the author. Um, and I want her to be, you know, she wants everything to be back to normal. So is that, uh, is that boring? I mean, she's been taking care of him, and she wants him out of the hospital, and then she gets home and thinks, oh, the thing I forgot is that he comes out of the hospital and he's mine. And now I'm, everything about his care is up to me, especially when he's not participating. So what happens when you've very carefully ministered to someone for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then you leave them alone for an hour, and you come back, and he's out there digging in the dirt. He's got his bare feet out there. And it's just like six weeks of exquisite care could be undone by this afternoon. So <clears throat> how you feel about Tony is completely your reading. Everybody has a different, everybody's reading is their reading, and I don't want to talk you out of it. Um, but she represents kind of, uh, the, she has come out of a different family than he has, and she really wants this, um, she has a vision of how they are as a family, and it's been so disrupted, and she very much wants them to get back on track. Um, and in a marriage that he said, she said, I was very drawn to it being, uh, she's outside of his great vision. <clears throat> Whatever has happened to him, she hasn't seen, and he can't explain until the very end. So she feels really, really left out. And then as far as Brooke is concerned, um, you're at, I mean, she is completely forgotten. And so what does that do to her behavior? Um, she's looking for connection, and she's not getting it in the most healthy way. Um, the point of view was a really tricky uh, choice. And in various drafts, things worked and things didn't. Um, so I was writing it what I was calling family point of view, where you're hearing about the world from each of them, but nobody outside the family gets point of view, right? It's only within the characters in the book. You never hear the doctors are never thinking. There's nobody in the neighborhood thinking about them. It's always somebody in the family. And, um, and then how to uh, monitor that so you as a reader don't feel like you're in a ping pong match. You don't just feel like you're slapped around and, wait, I'm looking at it from this angle. No, I'm looking at it from this angle. So you read a lot to see how other people have managed that. And also, why am I doing that? So every time the point of view changes, my goal is to take you, just like a camera in a, in a film, I want you to see through these people's eyes for a particular purpose. And when I make that dramatic point, and you as a reader would automatically take a breath or look up for a moment, then we can switch point of view. So it's not just within a scene, you're changing, changing, changing. It's always. Like that scene that I just read you, you're, you're in Tony's point of view. Um, and it's because she's worried about him, and she comes home, and now she's sort of experiencing this physical relationship with him in a, in a charged and new way. Um, he would describe that differently, right? So that's the, that's the charm of that choice of point of view, that I can show you each family member's um, uh, you know, journey. 
And just as you said, Brooke doesn't get her own chapter. Well, Brooke is shortchanged. And that, I have this theory about the DNA of the novel, so that every slice you take is the whole book. So point of view is the entire book. Verb tense is the entire book. The title, every character, every subplot is the same as the entire plot. So let's just use verb tense as an example. You, you asked about point of view, but I'll just give you verb tense. I wrote the entire novel in the past tense. I'd never written a novel. I'd never written a story in the present tense. I don't really love the present tense. It seems very slow to me. I am walking into the room. I am choosing my seat. I, it's like, sit down already. She sat down. Class started. So present tense seems to make this real-time elasticity that I don't love. When I'm trying to write it, it's like I can never get to where I want to get because there's always another, it's like a fractal problem. There's always another place you can go. So I wrote the whole book in past tense, and I took it with me to a writer's colony. I was supposed to be finishing it up. And I'm reading it, and it's too slow. Why is it too slow? In my mind, I had this notion of he's hit by lightning, and then the, the, the image is as if you were at a pool table. And they are all scattered. And it's supposed to be very violent and very fast and just headlong thrown into chaos. Why did it feel so slow? And then I realized that was a tense problem. To say he was hit by lightning, he then walked into the room, is to say that he survived it. Like past tense means it's in the past. And he is now on the other side of it. So there's a line where it says, he could not know at the moment that he was being, that he was inside the flash. So in present tense, that's he cannot know at the moment that he is inside the flash. He's on fire, and I need you to, to be there with him because I don't know if he's going to be okay. That's not my choice. My, the point of this novel is to ask that question, not to answer it. And so I had to rewrite the whole book in present tense. So I came home, and my husband said, are you done? <laughs> and I said, well, I've started a new draft in present tense. But it had to be done that way. I mean, that makes sense for the book. So each of those decisions is completely intentional, kind of obsessively so. I could go on, but I won't. Yeah? I have a question. So like going off structure, and you said how um, like you use a lot of point of view and you shift like two chapters. Um, but like chapter 10 is this uh, like texting conversation or like messaging? Yeah, what page is that on? Um, it's 122. And I was just wondering, like, what your intention was, like, sticking that, like, in the middle of the book, if that was, like, something you thought about, or, like, what, what you're trying to, like, tell the reader, like, switching your view. Yeah, so um, that's a calibration issue. I'm, I'm, uh, we've heard from Ricky, we've heard from Will, we've heard from Tony, we've heard, you know, so, um, and then this has happened to Brooke. And I was, keeping tabs on who and when and what we've heard from. And the boys have not, they used to be in constant contact. As soon as they go back to school after their father's accident, you know, Will was sort of coaching Ricky through things. And Ricky wakes up and hits the ground with this confidence that he never had before and doesn't need Will, um, doesn't reach out to Will. So it, it didn't make sense for them to have no contact. So that made sense to me that in the middle of the book, and then also you're playing with pacing, how many pages is each chapter. And the length of the chapter determines the kind of how a reader relaxes into it. You know? And so to have a one-page chapter that, that I hope covers a lot of territory. Um, I mean, they're checking in. They're both, both basically saying, have you been home? No. Have you been home? And then Ricky says, you know, Rumi might be bi. Know anyone who's bi? As in polar? No. Then no. Me neither. And, you know, he's basically sort of reaching out to his brother to talk about his sexuality, and, and that's not going to happen in this little one-page text. Um, so, you know, that, that would have been a situation where he could talk to his brother. His brother knows he had a crush on his teacher, his brother, you know, but his brother doesn't know about his teacher's husband. And, um, and any sort of lust he might have for, for that couple. And so that is another family break that has happened. And so to do it in that really truncated text form in a really short chapter was just kind of a way to flash the reader um, an update. 
it's like dee, 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 dee. <laughs> here's where they both are and then move on so I was trying to do it as succinctly as I could I can't stand it when people do that thing like once like the you know, once in fifth grade you know, that long expository flashback is the bane of my existence in teaching and writing yeah yeah Owen came first. <clears throat> the twins came second. Um, and in fact, that's another point of view issue. Like in an earlier draft, uh, we had Owen's chapter and then Will's chapter. And um, uh, when my early, I have a couple of people who read my work um, when I have a draft, and I do the same thing for them. It's amazing. Readers are just pattern making machines. And the third chapter used to be Owen's, uh, Owen's chapter. And it's just amazing how when Tony finally chimed in, people were like, no, this isn't Tony's book. This is Owen Will, Owen Will. Like, you, you are so set up for that as a reader. Like, I'm saying to you, here's how we're going to do it. And then when I deviate, I'm the author. It's like, stay with me here. And the reader's like, nope, nope, this is what you set up. And you now stepped away from it. So that, that didn't work, and it also didn't make sense. You should hear from Tony. I mean, for God's sake, it hit so close to home. You should hear from Tony earlier. So then I, I had to really think about um, Tony, and I was thinking about Tony. So um, I write a lot about marriage, and I feel that, um, again, like in that scene I read you, uh, I feel that on any given day, life is ridiculous, hilarious, moving as all get out, sublime, outrageous, tragic. That's just Thursday. And tomorrow, more of the same. So this notion that uh, an author is, is presenting to you the dark daily um, dilemmas of our life, and then this author is your comic, light touch. It's like, you know what? That, those two things braided together, I sort of feel like I'm, I'm shooting right between the two of those. And um, so I, I'm trying to show what would this um, magnificent, horrific accident wreak in at breakfast. And the fact that they got bills to pay. So what are we going to do about that? And that's another interesting thing. Like when I talk, I, you know, I go to these DC public schools. So some of them are in this neighborhood and some of them aren't. And, you know, we talk about kind of, is this book representative? Well, they're of a certain income. And it kind of doesn't matter. Like, whatever rung you're on, if in fact someone's taken out, a parent is injured, or, or um, you know, a tragedy befalls, or somebody loses a job, or that sort of thing, you're trying with all your might to hang on to whatever rung you're on. And it's a challenge. So this family is trying to stay here. Another family would be trying, you know, has gotten this far and was, is trying to stay here. Like right now I'm writing uh, about people in the turn of the century in coal mines in western Pennsylvania. And, you know, it's all they can do not to be on their backs picking at a coal seam and, and not get black lung. Um, and in that case, you know, one person in the family falls ill. You're off the chart. Yeah. Yes. To go back to research, um, did you talk to anybody who had gone through a near-death near experience and, and post-traumatic stress? I mean, did you talk to anybody who was concerned no. with it? No. Should I have? I don't know. I'm just wondering. No. Oops. <laughs> so the job is to convince people that, that uh, you know your stuff, right? Um, so I read a lot about lightning strikes. I read a lot about <coughs> lightning strikes. Um, and in that literature, there was some post-traumatic stress. Um, and then I've read a tremendous amount about autism spectrum disorder. And you know, may you never need to know that. Um, may the circumstances of your life be such that you don't need to know that. <laughs> but I know a lot about it. And, um, and so that kind of the, the impulsivity and the, and the perseveration and the echo uh, Lelia and, and the sort of and the, and the self-stimming, all of that uh, comes out of things I know and have read, um, and what he might do as a professional in that. So I felt very comfortable with that. Um, 
And you know, it's interesting, in my first novel, which is about refrigerator designers, there's a line where uh, a guy is in a coma and one engineer says to another, what's the difference between death and a coma? And I had uh, two volts, was what I had. So my brother's a bioengineer, so I called him and I said, you know, I just made this up. What is the difference between death and a coma? And he said, I, I guess about 11 millivolts. It's like, ooh, that's better. That's, that sounds better, doesn't it? So I changed it to 11 millivolts. Nobody, all these copy editors, nobody asked me a thing about the engineering in that book. So years later, I said to my brother, did I ever thank you enough for that line? That was such a great line, death in a coma, that the difference was 11 millivolts. He said, oh, I wonder if that's true. <laughs> I said, oh my god, did you make that up? He said, well, it sounded good at the time. <laughs> but he was more of an authority than I was, and he convinced me. So um, we talk about all, this a lot in the classes I teach of, of writing. I'm, I'm teaching graduate students in fiction writing, and then I'm also teaching master classes in the novel. And you can go down the rabbit hole with research, and maybe many of you have. I mean, you know, especially with the joy and the terror of Google. I mean, you can just keep clicking, and you can get to some amazing places, but it can also take you out of your writing. And there's, uh, there's one guy who has the three-click rule. Don't go past three clicks. Like, after you've gone through three clicks, go back to your text, because you could just keep researching and researching. And, um, and then the authority of your voice and your characters can carry people through a lot of uh, that knowledge. I go to all these book groups, too. So this is people, this is like 12 people in a room who talk about books all the time, right? Or they just drink wine and talk about their kids. Depends on the group. Um, and, <laughs> and so they are not accustomed to having the author in the room. So they will just go right after you, you know, because they're accustomed to taking a book apart. And so <laughs> they'll tell you this and that and the other. And one woman said something which actually was really smart, because I do feel like your reading is your reading. You know, some people will not like a character or not like a circumstance. So this one woman said to me, I think she was a shrink. The shrinks are always really interesting at book groups. She said, all the three children um, make terrible sexual choices. They're sort of sent into the world. And she felt that was an indication of a fissure between Tony and Owen, that the lightning has illuminated. And I thought that was a really smart reading that I had not really thought about. I mean, I was thinking about them each abandoned and making their way, and um, making their way with all sorts of mistakes because, in fact, they, are, they have stepped out of the spotlight of their parents' love and care. And, and so they're in danger, having, having being, being left out of that. I mean, Tony has to close ranks. She has to take care of him. But it means less for them, and they don't handle it very well. Um, but when this woman said that, I thought, that is really interesting. I didn't have to have each of them uh, battle with that, but I did. So I thought that was, that didn't offend me. I thought it was really interesting. Um, there, again, back to the first novel, there's a character in that novel who's uh, a real estate agent and very quite controlling. And there, there's always at a book group, there's always one, one, one woman who says, I don't like Judy. Judy's really, Judy's really way too controlling. And she's and all she cares about is that everything be just right, then she'll go to the restroom or something and someone will go, just like Judy, she's just like Judy. <laughs> so that's been an interesting situation that we have a tendency to, um, you know, glom on to the faults of people who have our faults. Just, just a little test that I have for each of you <laughs> and what character you object to. Now, mostly it's been fascinating and, and um, some, I, I have met some uh, people who are caring for someone who won't be getting any better. And they find Tony's impatience offensive. And, and then you'll learn that, in fact, they um, are in a situation where whoever, the, you know, if somebody is, has ALS or somebody has dementia, they have no choice but to be patient. So the idea that she is saying, OK, that's enough of that. You know, why don't you die or get better, um, uh, upsets them. Yeah. That's OK, too. I don't mind if it upsets them.
Yeah, I don't mind if we hash it out after you read. It's not, I don't feel, I feel like you send these books out into the world and then people speak it back to you. And it's incredibly flattering that someone has taken the time even to be offended by your book. I mean, isn't that weird? But what they're saying is that that vision of yours is not my vision. So now they've thrown something back to you and you can kind of work with that. And I find that really interesting. Yeah. Um, my question for you is that um, I want to know how your writing style developed over time. Um, like all your language is very descriptive and kind of did you always write like that or did you see yourself becoming, you know, like more and more descriptive as you wrote more? Mm -hmm. Um, I studied as an undergraduate uh, with Max Apple, and uh, I went to a very technical school. I went to Rice University in Houston, so it's a real nerd camp. And um, they had one creative writing class, and Max taught it. And he is of a kind of Isaac Babel, um, uh, Bernard Malamud uh, type of writer, so sort of Jewish magical realism is kind of what he writes, uh, exquisite writer, exquisite human being. And then I studied, I went to graduate school at Johns Hopkins where John Barth was my teacher and uh, the model was one teacher. So I had two teachers, one as an undergraduate for two courses and one as a graduate for two courses and that's it. So they're both kind of uh, cut of somewhat of the same cloth. Barth is more um, cerebral and proud of himself. He's like a little showy and um, not very emotive. And that's how all the engineers I grew up with were. <laughs> <laughs> and also most of the people I went to school with. And I have a math degree too. So that um, challenge for me was to be both cerebral and interesting and, and intricate and, and kind of logical and mathy and absurd, but also poignant to sort of strike both the heart and the head. And in doing that, I have become much more descriptive uh, because I think that in earlier writing and drafts, I assumed that the world was more like me. I think we do. I think you grow as you meet more human beings. You recognize that, oh, this vision I have is actually pretty singular. And I'm going to have to recreate it for you so that you will come along with me. Um, how on earth are we going to do that? So we're going to do it through character and language and plot and um, every single thing we can possibly think of. And um, the thing I learned just lately, and this is partly through teaching, in teaching you have to articulate your instincts, which is actually kind of good practice. Um, are you finding that? Like, oh, how do you do it? You have to actually say it. Yeah, that's hard. And so I've been doing a lot more teaching over the years. And the other day I was writing a descriptive scene, and then I thought, what is the heart, what is the emotional heart of this book? It should be in that scene too. That's like the special sauce. So I could describe this landscape to a T, but I haven't tied it to why on earth this person is seeing this landscape as distinct. It has to be part of the emotional power of the entire book. And I just could not believe I was so old to learn that. Like, why didn't I learn that 20 years ago? It would have been kind of helpful. But maybe you need to just practice other things. There's too many things to have to get right. A novel is really a lot of moving parts. And um, some people are really good at this, and some people are really good at this, and you have to learn all the other ones on your own, or with practice, or with other people. You don't have to learn it on your own. You can have some help. Yeah. They're wrong. <laughs> I think it's exactly the same thing. There, there are two ways to codify the world. I could do it with language, or I could do it with mathematical vision. And each one is a model. Language is totally imperfect. It's just a reach. It's just an attempt to explain the world, and so is math. And um, I got to the point, sort of, here's the graph of me in math and English. So you know, I started out really talented at math and not as adept at writing. And then I went to a school where the people who were very good at math were visionaries. 
I don't have, I have terrible spatial skills. So that limits me as a mathematician. Um, so I got to a point where I could recognize a proof incorrectly done, but I couldn't generate one. And I thought, oh, that's the difference in literature between a critic and a writer. You can recognize a text for its mistakes, but you go write one. Make me a story. Make me a novel. Um, it's really easy to take it apart. And that, and that, to me, was what I could do mathematically, but I couldn't generate pure math. And it kind of bummed me out. But I recognized that you know, I had a different calling. Yeah. Um. No, and as a parent, is anybody in here a parent? As a parent um, and a writer, especially a writer of things that have come true, you can't imagine, you can't spend the energy imagining terror being, you know. So the hardest thing for me was to imagine Will beating the crap out of that guy who may or may not be coming, getting better. That was, that was the toughest thing to write. So as I said, I love these characters all very much. And to make him physically take this guy down or be in the process of physically taking him down when he hits his own head um, was really hard. So that's very tricky. You know, I would ask myself, like, am I being... Um, uh, cowardly to not let, how badly would, can the children be damaged? Is that cowardly or is that just part of my vision? And you're asking yourself, like, but if I do, is that sensational? You know, I'm not just out for the prurient, cheap shot. So, you know, everybody struggles against whatever their limits are. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and that's one of the things that I asked myself. And then the other thing was that after my second novel, I have had the same publisher for all three books and the same editor for all three books, which is kind of unusual in the publishing world as it is now. So when my second book was published, my editor said to me, this is not a criticism, but, so you know what's coming, uh, <laughs> you have a tendency to take the reader up to the edge of the cliff and then start the next chapter with, after they fell off the cliff. And he was right. So my goal for this book was to take you right over the cliff. Everybody go right through the fire. And um, I was really conscious of trying to take each character through the pain that, that he or she was feeling. But I didn't consider striking any of the children. It's funny because I would probably say that to one of my students. Well, try it with the kid. Try it with the wife. Try to see what happens. Yeah. How did you choose the exact scene um, where Owen got struck by lightning in regards to like dogfish head and the quarter and the parking meter? It just came to me. That was a gift. Yeah. And um, we had been occasionally we go to Rehoboth. Any, are any of you from around? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So you've been on that corner. And now, you know, it's more as interesting as that question is, is the question of time, because now there aren't parking meters there. So, well, you've said it in a certain time, because then there were. Um, and uh, I needed it to be um, at the end of vacation. And I needed it to be, um, you know, what's the question is, what's the clock in the book? Well, the clock is right before everybody goes off to school and when they would again gather. So Thanksgiving is sort of your logical place for them to again gather. And um, where would they be on the last night of vacation? And then I could play with the notion of that house being um, uh, what it is to Tony versus what it is to Owen versus what it is to the children and who Kyra was as, as Will and Ricky knew her growing up and who she is sort of seeing her with fresh eyes and um, going back to the house. And, so I, I just needed sort of a vacation spot, and I chose Rehoboth and, and had, you know, had been there a few times. Um, but we should all go back. We should have this discussion at Rehoboth, at Dogfish Head and Rehoboth. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Um, I noticed that you have different covers for, for This is hardcover. You guys have paperback. And they have different images on them. Mm -hmm. um, 
what goes on the front of the bus. Also, nice. Isn't that nice? Um, I did, and it's a, it's a whole long conversation. Um, so for years, I worked in the Sackler and Freer, the Asian art galleries of the Smithsonian, and I, did, I was the chief editor there. I did publications with them. And when my first novel came out, the de designer said to me, God, it's so weird. We argue about what beautiful object to put on the cover of our catalogs, but a book designer has to read a book and pick an image, not necessarily in the book, to describe an entire novel. I mean, that's a big chore. And um, so the designer that they assigned to me was sort of world class. And the first cover was so not descriptive of the book. It was very odd. It had a coin with somebody who looked, it looked like a dime. Uh, it looked like FDR. And then lots of geometric pretty colors. And you know, so you have to say, um, this is what you'll learn as you grow older. You have to say, what a great design. I'm wondering how come this is, looks more like a dime instead of a quarter. <laughs> and how come Owen has a beard? This guy doesn't have a beard. And people who I've shown it to say it looks a little bit like FDR. I'm wondering what you're thinking here to say, what is up with this cover, right? So then five covers later is this cover. And uh, right before this cover was only type, because I think I had exhausted them. Sometimes they don't let you contribute. And um, I, I do have a lot of years in art publication and a little bit of experience in how to talk to them about that. Maybe that's why they let me have the conversation. Maybe not. Maybe they're, maybe they're being generous. Because I, I know people who say, I didn't even get a, a vote. I got a vote, so I got to say many times, don't really think we're quite there. Um, so when it was all type, it's beautiful type, and it's nice and big. I have a difficult last name, and so it's nice to have it just great big. And I said, I really think you're missing the opportunity to capture somebody with the strangeness and the charm of the book. And then he said, I think we've got it. And I love this cover. I absolutely love it. So then on the paperback, he, um, a different designer, um, it's just a whole new it's a little bit different company, and so they use that chance to reimagine it. And what was funny about that was, I like that cover very much too, but when, when he did that cover at the penultimate step, I asked some question, and they took it back to the designer who said, oh my god, I got this from a video game. Like I need to make the male character more distinct so that you don't know where I got that from. So good thing you dropped by my desk today. Yeah, so. Um, everybody's inspired by something different and is trying to communicate the entire book. And, you know, I just like that this, just to take it apart as an image, that, that it's a retro kind of um, uh, grill and that this looks, this is artificial turf and that it's just obviously something is very wrong, you know, it's smoking. But it also kind of looks like a baby carriage with those little, you know, I mean, you don't have to look at it that long. You don't have to even care about it. But it's, gra it's visually interesting. And it says summer gone wrong. You know, so it, it, they're trying to do all of that. Um, and my first novel was about uh, electrical engineers, two electrical engineers uh, who are refrigerator designers. And the cover is just these two orange ends of the plugs, the male end and the female end, which says it all. So it ha the, the book has nothing to do with plugs and, and wiring. It's about a man and a woman who are electrical engineers. And so that just conjures that up right away. Um, it's quite an art. So how about one more question, and then we'll wrap up the discussion. And then uh, Mary Kay is very graciously agreed to sign some books um, afterwards. I'd be happy to sign your books. Yes. Last question. Well, my first novel was a screenplay was written of it, and I got to read that screenplay, and it's a very strange experience. It's like someone saying to you, I had the same dream you had, but here's how I wrote it up. It's so odd, because all sorts of different dramatic decisions are made. She made some really good ones, and she made, you know, she put in a chase scene, she put in, like, there's no chase scene in the novel. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the second novel is about, it takes place in an Asian art museum, and this object falls to the floor and into dust. And a lot of people said to me, like, this should be a movie. But the kind of 
big dramatic moment at the beginning of that book is that the director gets a memo. So it's interesting how drama in a novel versus drama in a, in a um, book are so different. So the book I'm working on now, I started it with the idea that it was a screenplay and I took a little screenplay course which was taught by a friend of mine and every time he said about like here's how you do it he would look up at me and say you don't do it that way do you? Because writing a novel the discovery, I don't lay it out, you're discovering it as you go. Some people lay it out, I'm not saying this is the right way to do it, I'm just saying this is how I do it. And if I know where I'm going I'm not so interested, like I've solved the problem so why go there? Um, but to ask the question and keep rooting around and teasing these things apart and together, really interesting things happen. And in a screenplay, you really have to know. Um, and that's why everyone's writing a screenplay, because what they're really doing is shuffling the cards of their storyboard before they write it. And um, would I love to see it? Uh, somebody told me that there's a musical of a guy struck by lightning that's being worked on. So there goes your opportunity for this to be turned into a movie. <laughs> but, you know, would I love to see it as a movie? Sure, I'd love to see it as a movie.